Hi, I'm Dara Pettinelli. I'm here with Disney's Babbel.com with Senator, uh, Secretary Duncan, and we're here to talk about education following up after the President's State of the Union address. We've taken questions from parents, students, and educators throughout the country, and we'll continue to take them throughout the session. Just tweet with the hashtag WHChat and at Babbel Editors, and we'll make sure that they get funneled through. Um, our first question is from Heather in Albany. She wants to know, should the sequester occur on March 1st, how is the department planning to assist already cash-strapped states? The president has made it clear that Head Start is a priority, yet it's about to be cut drastically. Uh, first of all, it just was a fantastic night last night. We can sort of talk about that. I'm a little bleary-eyed, so if I say something wrong, I apologize. Yeah, right. uh, but it's really, really exciting just to, to be a part of that and to be in that room. is amazing. And the president basically opened the State of the Union talking about the the horrendous impact that sequester would have on children, on communities around the country and challenge Congress to get their act together to avoid it. Um, the simple truth, and I always try to be very honest, the simple truth is if sequester, ha if sequester happens, there's very little we can do to protect those cash-strapped you know, communities mm -hmm. and whether it's Head Start, whether it's poor children with Title I dollars, whether it's, uh, you know, it's children with disabilities with IDA, um, the, 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 the sad truth, the honest reality, is that they will be a hit. And mm -hmm. I'm actually testifying tomorrow before Congress around the devastating impact of sequester. I desperately hope Washington come together in a bipartisan way and solve this. The President talked about sort of disasters that we can't avoid and disasters we can't avoid. This is clearly one we can't avoid. Um, and we're going to do everything we can to avoid it. But if it does happen, there are no good and there are no easy answers. Right. Fair enough. Uh, Ramon from New York City wants to know, do you think two years of pre-K in public schools will help improve long-term education results following the Union City, New Jersey model? Yeah. I just think, I've said repeatedly, the best investment, the best investment we can make in education is in high quality early childhood education. Mm -hmm. I was just so thrilled. I was like, I goosebumps last night listening to the president talk about it. Because so often, um, it's easy for politicians to walk away from pre-K. Uh, three and four-year-olds don't vote. <laughs> they don't have lobbyists. The benefits of this, by definition, will be after most politicians are out of their current offices. So it takes someone with real vision and real commitment to say, this isn't about during my tenure, but this is better for my community or for my country long term. The president's commitment here is extraordinary. Um, he sees the huge difference we can make. We have to stop playing catch up in education. Mm -hmm. And we have far too many children who enter kindergarten already a year or two behind. And we're constantly playing catch up at every level. The only way to get to, to avoid that is to get our babies off to a great start. And so if we can do this, again, do it in a bipartisan way, make sure children, but particularly children from disadvantaged communities, have a chance to have access to great early childhood opportunities. Those are life transforming opportunities. It's the right thing to do for kids in the communities. And there's been study after study saying the, the financial benefits to society for every dollar we spend in this, you get back seven, eight, nine, ten dollars in return. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the human side, whether it's the moral side, whether it's the educational side, or whether it's the financial side, this is the right thing to do. And the, the buzz last night was just so positive around this. I desperately hope we can work on this together. Well, similar to that, as a follow-up, Reese from Michigan wants to know about how we're, we're testing or grading teachers. He says, when assigning the potential and success for teachers in schools, how do we account for the inherent disadvantages those face in challenging, dangerous, or impoverished areas? Is it fair that they be graded on the same rubric or scale as those in healthier sectors? Yeah, so I think it's really important always in teacher evaluation to look at multiple measures. And anytime you're looking at just any one measure, whatever that is, that makes no sense, whatever, particularly if it's a test score. What I'm always interested, though, is looking in growth and gain, how much are students improving. And as a piece is one piece of a more robust, comprehensive evaluation system, what you need to look is like students against like students. So English language learners compared to English language learners. Children living below the poverty line versus other children living below the poverty line. And when you do that, you still see the amazing impact. Despite all the huge, very real challenges that we have to take on around poverty, around hunger, around safety, you still see huge advantages that those children from those uh, difficult uh, backgrounds and upbringings have when they, when they uh, um, have the chance to go to one, two, three great teachers in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and then also around how our school system is structured, Karen Wall from Texas asked, the current education, education system as I understand it was developed during the Industrial Revolution when children were being ready to take on manufacturing jobs. 
Given the, ter the current technological revolution, are there plans to revamp the school system? We have to revamp in so many different ways. And you know, just a, a, the basic calendar of the school year is based upon the agrarian economy and not many of our kids are working in the fields anymore. Mm -hmm. So I've talked very publicly about extending the school year, again, particularly for children who are behind, disadvantaged children, longer days after school, uh, summers, weekends, whatever it takes so they catch up. The goal has to be to get our dropout rate to zero. We have a 25% dropout rate in this country. It's staggering. That's a million young kids leaving our schools for our streets, and we know there are no good jobs out there anymore. So you have to get that to zero. We have to increase graduation rates. But we have to make sure our children are graduating college and career ready. And far too many of our high school graduates are actually taking remedial classes in college. They're not ready. And it's mm -hmm. too expensive and they're burning Pell Grants. So more time, great, techno uh, great teachers. But I think technology can also be a great equalizer. And the chance for children to learn 24-7 about anything, anytime, anywhere. My wife and I have two young children at home. Our daughter's in fifth grade, our son's in third. And to have them have the chance to pursue their interests, mm -hmm. technology um, can be, I think, a great tool for increasing equity, but also expanding excellence. And so looking at all those things, looking at talent and teachers, looking at how we use time, and thinking about how we use technology you know, during the school day, after school, at home. But the fact that our school days in the vast majority of places are still the same thing they were 100, 150 mm -hmm. years ago, makes no sense whatsoever. That's not what other countries are doing. Right. And our children today are competing in a global marketplace. They're not competing in their neighborhood or in their district and their state for jobs. They're competing with children in India and China mm -hmm. and Singapore and South Korea. And I know, I'm convinced our children are as talented, as smart, as creative, as entrepreneurial, as hardworking as children anywhere in the world. We just have to level the playing field for them. We have to give them a chance. There are certain districts, certain schools starting to be very, very creative in, this, in these areas, mm -hmm. but not enough. We're not sort of at that tipping point yet. I'm trying to do everything I can to push in that direction. Well, that um, brings up the next question from Kelly Wickham in Chicago. She asked, and she's an educator as well, she asked, who are the innovators in education right now that we should be looking at? Well, there's no one, you know, one person or one district. People always say, what's the model district? Every district right. has strengths and weaknesses. Um, but just on the technology, I'll give you one. There's a, a district that's relatively underfunded in uh, North Carolina called Mooresville. And I think, my numbers won't be exact, but out of like 117 districts there, they're like the 100th in terms of funding. And they have a very interesting visionary superintendent who's doing some different things. A few years ago, he stopped. Again, they don't have a lot of money. They stopped buying textbooks, started to put a lot of money into technology and not technology for technology's sake, but technology as a teaching tool for students, technology to empower teachers to help each other in very different ways. In a short amount of time, students in Mooresville, not only are test scores going up, which is one piece, but graduation rates are up significantly, dropout rates are down. So places like that, we're starting to see not just individual pockets of excellence, but a whole district moving in, in a different direction. Very, very interesting to watch. That is interesting too, and with technology, and you speak a lot about the curriculum and how we need to change that. Um, Michelle, who is mom to Oliver from Savannah, Georgia, has um, shared an interesting question about the, the emphasis on tests, and her question is, despite the promise of race to the top, my son's public school, system, public school education is still heavily influenced by test prep, which is not in tune with his development or his curriculum. My wonderful teachers and administrators feel forced to do this. What are you doing to ensure that assessments are designed and properly used and that drilling for the test doesn't replace education and learning? Yeah, well, it's a huge concern and it's a huge worry. It's, again, frankly, something my wife and I are concerned about with our own children. Yeah. And let me be really clear, I think it is important to evaluate students each year. Some people say we should do no testing, but I think it's really important for teachers to know not what are they teaching, but what are students learning. But where their tests are happening all the time or too frequently, when they're not aligned to the curriculum, when it doesn't make sense, you, you have to sort of step back and say, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. When I led the Chicago Public Schools, we had the state test, which we needed to do, and we, had, we were also taking the Iowa test. I actually eliminated the Iowa test, so I cut out 50% of the testing that our kids were doing. There's also a distinction between sort of end of year tests to see what students learned, but also whether it's daily or weekly or monthly, ongoing evaluations, not where it's high stakes, but really understanding, again, not what am I teaching, but what are my students learning? Technology, again, is a huge tool here that's really empowering teachers to see sometimes literally on a daily basis, okay, we taught whatever this third grade activity was, 
20 of my children got it, seven didn't. How do I reteach those seven the next day? And I think the more we're thinking not about testing, but about ongoing assessments, evaluation, really understanding where teachers are being effective, where they can think about grouping students differently, there's huge power in, do, in doing that. The counterbalance, again, is where you're over-testing, where you're doing a ton of test prep, what I call drill and kill, that's not beneficial for students. It's not teaching them the habits of mind that we need. And we need to have very, very honest conversation about everything we're doing. What is the purpose? Is that helping us create students who are going to be lifelong learners, who are going to be engaged in their own learning? That's got to be the goal. Mm -hmm. um, switching gears a little bit, uh, Missy Carson Smith from Michigan uh, writes in, I am a mother of four and a former school teacher for many years. My kids are the same ages as those slain at Sandy Hook. My brother was also killed in a school-related shooting. What solutions can our leaders present to depoliticize gun discussion when it comes to children's safety? Well, I first just want to say how sorry I am about her personal loss. And uh, last week, I met with a number of the parents from Sandy Hook who lost their babies there. That was, I think, last Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, on Saturday, I traveled to Chicago with the First Lady to go to the funeral of Hydea Pendleton, who was a 15-year-old honors student who had just completed her final exams, was literally in a park swinging on swings like a innocent kid should do. And some other teen jumped over a fence and started shooting randomly, killed her, two of her friends were shot. And this is an issue that I've dealt with, uh, frankly, all my life growing up in the south side of Chicago. So this one's very, very personal. Um, we have to take the politics out of it. For me, the two goals are extraordinarily simple. We have to create climates in which our children are growing up free of fear, and we have to create climates in which our, in which our children um, are not being shot dead. And there are a number of things that we've recommended that are on the White House web website that the President and Vice President provided huge leadership around. A number of things we want Congress to help us do. Uh, you know, having background checks for people buying guns seems very logical to me, non-political. The vast majority of gun owners and NRA members support that. We should be able to get that done less high-capacity magazines, less assault weapons. There's a number of executive actions that we want to take and not wait for Congress, that we just want to move on very, very quickly. We have to think about this comprehensively. Reducing gun violence is obviously the goal. You have to look at the, the mental health piece of this. That's very, very important. The President has challenged me and my good friend Kathleen Sebelius to, to partner and co-chair a task force around this. We have to do everything we can to make schools safer, but frankly, schools are often the safest place our children are. We have to really, you know, that's a starting point. We have to focus on their communities as well. Um, we have to talk about violent video games and movies, and we have to do all of these things at the same time. My worry is that too often Congress has a short attention span and wants to focus on a very simplistic answer, and we have to be comprehensive. And as I, you know, meet with these parents and look in their eyes and attend their funerals, that could be me, that could be you, and it's just unimaginable the devastation this is having on families and on communities. And again, I worry so much about children wondering now about if they grow up, if I grow up, not when I grow up. So we have to get this done. The President talked passionately and eloquently about this at the end of the State of the Union last night, and we have to take this on, and again, take all the politics, all the ideology out of it, I think, and I hope and I pray, we can agree that we need a lot fewer children living in fear, we need a lot fewer children being shot dead. If that's the premise, the status quo now is untenable. The status quo is absolutely unacceptable. And I think post Sandy Hook, which was you know, whatever, six, six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, we've had like another thousand Americans killed due to gun violence. It's just absolutely staggering. And if we don't act now as a country, I'm just convinced we never will. So mm -hmm. we're at a fork in the roads, and I'm gonna do everything I can, personally, professionally, as is the president, as is the vice president, to make sure our children, my children, all of your, you know, everyone uh, tuning in here, everyone's children can grow up in a climate free of fear. Um, you know, that does tie in very well with our next question. Um, some parents are, feel that their kids are safer being homeschooled. Rachel Fawcett from Georgia wants to know, what is the government's policy and perspective on homeschooling as a viable means of education? Again, I'm very agnostic and you know, want to give people different options. So where parents and you know, children think that's a great option, that's fantastic. The vast majority of you know, children, 98, 99% mm -hmm. are going to go to some form of, of a school. 90% of children in this country always have and always will go to public schools. Mm -hmm. 
So the, what I spend all day thinking about is how do we make every single public school a great school? How do we make every single public school a school of choice? Many are just absolutely amazing. Others have a lot of hard work to do, and we're willing to challenge the status quo when that happens. Um, so my focus is on how do we make sure children and families have great, great options to choose from. Okay. And Pilar from Illinois wants to know, how is funding for special needs education and awareness being addressed? So uh, in every area, whether it's special ed, whether it's money for English language learners, whether it's money for poor children, whether it's money to take uh, classes, dual enrollment classes, AP classes, college credit while in high school, whether it's money for children with special needs, I just continue to say this is the best investment we can make as a country. And if we don't do that, we do, it, we do our nation a grave disservice. Not everyone agrees with me. There are lots of folks in Congress who I have to do battle with who see education as an expense, not an investment. And whatever people can do to help their congressmen, regardless of politics and ideology, understand we have to invest. Uh, one of many areas where we underinvest is support for students with disabilities. But it's just not there. Again, I think we underinvest in, in lots of other areas, including early childhood education. That's why I want to do a lot more there. So again, take politics and ideology out of it. Whatever folks can do to let their congressmen know that the best thing we can do is give every single child a well-rounded, world-class education. And uh, that's going to cost some money. Now, we have to be honest enough to when things aren't working to stop funding those and just can't ask for more without change. And I always say, I don't want to invest in the status quo. I want to invest in a vision of reform. But if anyone thinks that we can do this on the cheap, that's not what other countries are doing. Other countries are doubling down on education. And uh, I think, again, our country has to come to grips with the, thing, with, with the idea and the belief that this is the best investment collectively we can make. Very good. Um, Asha from Oregon wants to know, given the research connecting movement and exercise with health and learning, why are recess and physical education shrinking parts of the school day? They, they shouldn't be. And this is, again, very, very personal. You know, First Lady's done an amazing job on Let's Move, but obviously I grew up running around and playing basketball. My wife's a former athlete who was a PE teacher for about five years and then was the athletic director now is part of a nonprofit that builds playgrounds. And, I just speaking for myself, I was one of those young boys that if I had to sit still in my chair for five or six hours straight, um, I felt bad for my teacher. If I had a chance to run around, recess, lunchtime, PE, burn off a little steam, I could come back and concentrate. And as, uh, as they said, all the research shows, all the research shows that when you're active physically, when you have healthy lifestyles, you do better academically. And so whether it's during the school day, whether it's at lunch, whether it's after school, whether it's PE, whether it's recess, we have to create opportunities for students to be physically fit. We have to be teaching them healthy lifestyles. We have to be teaching them about nutrition as well. And where you have high levels of obesity, where you have students that are sitting still all day, we just can't be as successful as we want academically. And I always say there's so many false choices in education, whether people debate you know, college versus careers. So for me, it's got to be college and careers. People debate you know, academic time versus you know, more, more recreational physical, you know, time for physical activity, time to play. We just need to do both. We have to do both. It's got to be both and, not either or. And when we make those choices, we compromise what's best for children. We have to stop doing that. You said something very interesting about how you were you know, a young boy. You always wanted to move. Uh, Caridwin Morris from New York wants to know how schools can better address the unique, need, unique needs of boys. There are so many studies and articles coming out about how the school system favors girls and our boys, she thinks, are developing uh, low self-esteem at an early age. So I, I think if you sort of step back, again, this goes back to where we were as a nation in terms of education for 100, 150 years, where right. we need to be now. For me, whether it's boys and the re real issues there, whether it's girls, whether it's African-American boys or Latino boys or whatever it might be, I think at the end of the day, what we need to do is get this idea of sort of an individualized education plan for every child. And how do we meet not just their academic needs, but their physical and their social and emotional needs. And every child is different. Every child has unique strengths and weaknesses. And my two children, you know, same two parents, same household, same family, radically different strengths and interests and needs. And so the idea of teaching everybody the same thing at the same time, the same way every day, just doesn't make any sense right. whatsoever. And so again, whether it's boys, whether it's teenagers, whether it's girls, whatever it might be, how do we spend time with that child and their family, understand their strengths, understand their weaknesses, figure out what we do, not just during the school day, but after school and then reinforce it at home so those child's, that child's needs are being met. That's the kind of idea we need to move to some places of great, great creativity there. But this idea of uniformity and conformity just doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we talked a lot about early education, and now um, I think it's a, a good ending question to talk about college. Um, Susan Jackson from Indiana asks, as an older college student who has had to work and go to school full time, I have depleted my financial aid, and paying for the nursing program I'm hoping to get into is not something I can do alone. Will there be any increase in college education assistance from the government in addition to scholarships? Yeah, so long, long way to go in this area, but maybe the thing I'm most proud of that we accomplished in the first term was an additional $40 billion, 40 with a B, $40 billion for Pell Grants. And we did that without going back to taxpayers for a nickel. We simply stopped subsidizing banks, put all that money into young people. Wildly controversial here in Washington. We thought it was total common sense. In the past couple of years, we've gone from 6 million Pell recipients to over 9 million, a 50% increase. Many first-generation college goers. That's been fantastic. Huge emphasis on community colleges. But having said that, the costs of college are still crushing mm -hmm. people. And not just in disadvantaged communities. This is middle-class families as well. And whether I go to the grocery store, to the dry cleaners, or I'm on an airplane, almost everywhere I go, someone's coming up saying, what can you do to help? We can't do it by ourselves. I always talk about shared responsibility. States have to continue to invest in higher education. This past year, 40 states, Republican and Democrat, cut funding to higher education. That's not good. Universities have to keep their costs down. The president talked about this. Some universities are doing a great job. Others, the tuition is increasing much faster than the rate of inflation. So we want to continue to invest um, at the federal level. States have to step up. Colleges have to uh, behave differently, or many do as well. What we also need is just greater transparency, greater information. As parents and you know, returning to school, uh, working adults, they need to know what schools are doing the right thing. And the president challenged us to come up with a scorecard that looked at cost and looked at value and looked at affordability. Um, that scorecard uh, I talked about last night, we literally launched today. It's on the website. And our hope is that with transparency, people will make better choices. And we need to continue to invest. But we have 7,000, over 7,000 institutions of higher education. We still today have the best system of higher education in the world. But it's often so complicated, so opaque that it's very, you know, particularly if you're you know, new to the country, your first time going to college, it can be so difficult to navigate that. With just greater transparency, I want more young people voting with their feet. And good universities will get rewarded, and more students will come that way. And those where graduation rates are too low and costs are too high, less people start to go there, mm -hmm. that creates a little bit of pressure. And so we're going to make a huge play around transparency. We want to continue to invest very, very heavily, but we have to challenge states to step up, and universities have to do the right thing as well. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. It was a real pleasure meeting you and, and having this conversation. Uh, it will play again. It's live, but you can also watch it on babbel.com. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.